Hi, this is Manos Burlakis from Minneapolis Heart Institute. It is a great pleasure to present Dr. Gambis Masayeki, who is going to present Case 65 for the second edition of the Manual of CTO Interventions. Dr. Masayeki is from the University Heart Center in Bad Crossingen, one of the most experienced and highest volume European CTO operators. Gambis, thanks again for presenting this case. Thank you, Manos, for having me. So, um, yeah, actually, these are two cases, um, but, but uh, first we focus on the first one for sure. So. Um, I want to talk about a case uh, where I had to go subintimal. It's a spiral stenting, and I created a subintimal neoluminal helix around a massively calcified osteal RCA occlusion, a patient which has recurrent ventricular tachycardia. So, in some uh, some situations, uh, we know that uh, if it's a huge calcification, we, we, uh, even if we want to stay in true lumen, it's uh, sometimes not possible and we have to go around. And this is a case where I had to go around. So, a 49-year-old man, post cabbage with renal transplantation in the 1990s and as a, another uh, a, a transplant failure in 2005 and another retransplant in 2008. So, 49 years old. He had a, a secondary hyperparatyridism and which causes also the calcium load, I think. And in March 2014, he had a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction was treated in the vein graft to reduce marginal branch. So he had an internal uh, kind of virtue implanted um, in May 2014 to non-sustained uh, non um, uh, non VTs and ejection fracture of 40, uh, 25. So uh, in July 2014, he was re-hospitalized during a recurrent episode of ventricular tachycardia, <clears throat> and uh, that was the first time when uh, they showed me the patient. It was in Austria, and he had a, a, a GFR of 42, <clears throat> and they showed me the angio and asked me if, uh, if I could help the patient. So this is the situation where we have this really very calcified RCA, and you can see from the left side, uh, yeah, beautiful collaterals to the PDA branch. Uh, here is the uh, one uh, wing graft to the lateral wall and here is the lima graft to the LED which is uh, patent. And uh, this is the LV function. It's a poor LV function with a severe hypokinesia in the, pos in the inferior wall. And um, so, so yeah. So first of all, uh, the question uh, is, uh, uh, would you go for direct uh, yeah, attempt of the RCA? We have a GFR of 42. We know that the patient has two renal fa uh, failure of transplantation. Is a GCTO score 4. Uh, would we go for more anti therapy? Actually, he had only beta, a beta blocker and, uh, and a little QT prolongation. Or would we go for a VT ablation? Or would you go for viability testing? So what would you do, Manus? Yeah, that's a great, um, a great question. I guess mm. the other question is, is he scheming or not? So doing um, viability testing would be something interesting. I think he's probably viable because there was some hypokinesis in the inferior wall, although it was not it was not akinetic, so I presume it's going to be viable. Another possibility here would be to look at the vein graft 2M. There seems to be some lesion there. That's easy to do. One, we would do that and see how he does. But I think uh, mo most likely he is cutting significant ischemia in a very large RCA territory, and that's going to be probably the culprit for his VT as well. Yeah. So that's what they did also. Um, so uh, it was done in, 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 in PET, um, and uh, there was viability and also uh, ischemic uh, inferior wall and uh, in a hard team decision uh, they uh, the decision was failed to do to try to open the RCA so we have the impact of chronic total occlusion the fuck related atrial and long term outcome of ventral tachycardia we know that if we ablate the people that they have a high load of recurrence VT so it's an uh, at, at the moment a uh, problem which is not solved so uh, here we are going, uh, it is a double injection, and as you can see here, it was really a ostal occlusion, so ostal occlusion of the RCA. As you can see here, so really very calcified ostal occluded lesion. So the question which I ask is, I personally don't see a chance to open a Westland, I stop here. Yeah, I mean, I, I was also thinking a lot uh, about this Westland and uh, about this situation in ejection fracture of 24. I penetrate the anti-grade cap and then I, uh, I try a single or parallel wire or whatever. I penetrate the anti-grade cap, knuckle down, a cross pulse and re-enter with the sing ray, or I try to go direct retrograde. So, what is the, what is really your preferred uh, strategy in this case? 
Yeah, that's a great point. First of all, I think you know the number one. Obviously, this is a complex case, so to do this yeah. case, you have to be comfortable with complex PCI. Otherwise, you should not do it. I completely agree with that one for less experienced operators. Otherwise, the patient has clearly a clinical indication for canalizing it. So, in such cases, you have to do whatever we can to make them uh, benefit. So, the question is, can you get any good undergrade purchase with your guide and be able to advance any wires? It looked to me like there wasn't much undergrade, but maybe worth putting in amplets and see if you can advance any wires. If not, then it would be a primary retrograde attempt. Yeah. Clear, clear opinion, and uh, that was also so. Uh, what I thought, I just tried to test with some some wire anti grade, but uh, I didn't do a great anti grade escalation. So I really uh, changed relatively quickly to retrograde approach. You see also here in the septum some loop, but it was not a problem with uh, the crosshair to follow it. And there was a the distal cap. So we have still a very calcified long occlusion. And interestingly, first I tried to, to penetrate with several wires, but the only wire I could penetrate was a stato 20 grams. So it was really calcified there. And, um, and the astatos uh, went a little bit up and stocked somewhere in the calcium. So uh, the next was that I brought the Corsair up. And um, here I had this situation uh, where I had a failed retrograde puncture with the Astatus 20 and I tried to go anti-grade with a Gaia 3 and the, the, the Gaia 3 was not controllable at all and anti-grade balloon was not, I, I couldn't pos, uh, position an anti-grade balloon and the anti-grade crosshair also stocked in calcium so this, this was my, my, my situation so as you can see here I have some millimeters where I entered with a wire but neither I could uh, penetrate retrograde cap with the stiffest wire we have and uh, I couldn't also not create place with anti-grade uh, with, with anti wires or anti-grade balloons so then I, I tried to make, create a knuckle, a retrograde knuckle, uh, to create some space there and with the hope that I, I, I will, uh, yeah, I, I can enter this space, uh, this created space with an anti -grade device. And it did work. And uh, so I could puncture with my Gaia and uh, then also Corsair could follow. So, and I was, as you can see here at the proximal part, it's uh, probably the same space. And then I went around with the Corsair around the calcium. And uh, here I took an anti-grade um, um, pilot 200 to go down. And uh, in the distal part, I had some like kissing wire position. And it was very, very interesting. I was so lucky that the pilot just went down so I had a kissing wire position and I solved finally the case with the anti -grid. so so uh, then I brought the crosshair down exchange to extra support wire and I wanted to dilate and here in the curve I had the problem that the balloon at 22 atmospheres couldn't deflate so the question is uh, what should we do the balloon expansion failed. Should we rotoplate in the supertimal space? Should we use, so we have the high pressure balloon up to 30, uh, 40 uh, to 50 uh, atmospheres. Should we try to go with cutting in subintimal space or should we try to stand and postulate then with another high pressure balloon? So what, what, would, you, what would you suggest? Yeah, that's a great, uh, a great challenge there. So I think rotoblation is probably the best way to deal with this. It looks like extremely calcified. You're gonna have hard times. Like some cases where the laser can help there too, can, but the laser is not as good for calcium. So as long as you can have a uh, rotablation, I think it's probably preferable. The other option is do the Carlino, put some contrast there and see if you can blow up the wall. That's probably not as, as, um, as a nice one. So I think in this particular case, you don't want to stand until you make sure you expand the balloon. Yeah. So I, I haven't tried the high pressure balloon. Maybe mm -hmm. that would be an option. I have an experience with this. Otherwise I would say rotablation is probably the way to okay. go. Okay. <coughs> so what we did is, um, we did a high pressure balloon angioplasty. We, we have this uh, from SES Medical, Swiss company, and uh, these balloons go up to 45, 50 atmospheres. And they have two layers, and when they rupture, so they lap rupture atraumatically. So because the outer layer is, is uh, so it's, it's not like you have the whole pressure on the outer layer. So that's, that's a good thing, yeah. And I was able after uh, I was able to to to, to uh, crack this calcium with about forty five atmospheres, and then I was able to bring uh, the the guideliner down, and then I stand it with four truck looting stands. So after standing, 
uh, this uh, this primer result primer result and uh, so I did uh, post dilatation with a Falcon 50 uh, and uh, then I checked an IVUS and I had still a lot of recoil in the proximal mid stem part so uh, you can't see yeah, probably you can see a little bit but it was really not nice expanded so in this situation we had some uh, old uh, taxus element stand somewhere in the lab where uh, they have a lot of radial force i have to say and uh, so it put a second stand layer and uh, uh, the mid part and the proximal uh, we put another science 38 so, uh, so so pardon me proximal the taxus but there was the most compression of the of the struts and in the mid part a second uh, Science Pro because we had only this big 4.5 Texas element in 5.0. At this time, there were no other uh, drug eluting stands for left stem, and so sure. we had some of this. So, this was finally after a really lot of work you see, 240 minutes uh, of time and 132 minutes of fluoroscopy time and uh, 26,000 centigray i don't have the air camel uh, for this case and i was really cautious regarding uh, contrast it was 150 cc so this was the final result so we brought the patient back to six month follow-up and uh, because i was a little bit skeptical regarding the spiral standing around around this uh, this calcified rca and what you can see were some tiny aneurysm formation and uh, also some uh, yeah some instant restenosis in the mid part. Uh, we did FFR and we did IVOS, um, but there was no ischemia, uh, uh, so we, we, we let it like like this. So now uh, we have a two year follow up of the patient and he has no angina anymore, and uh, no, no, sorry, no VTs anymore, and we published the case also in the Journal of Thoracic Disease. Probably a fast a second case where we had also where I'd also go around the calcium because it was so calcified in this time with an integrate uh, approach. Um, probably similar the same. So GCTOS core four, but not an osteal occlusion. Just went down with a polymeric wire uh, after penetration to cap. And as you can see here, knuckled around the calcium, then blocked the balloon, brought the uh, uh, the, the guideliner down and uh, brought the retrograde wire down, did an IVUS controlled retrograde reentry, re uh, re and this was the result. Uh, you see some staining here, but uh, no, no tamponade. And, uh, and uh, we had also this patient follow up 12 months later, and you can see here the 12 month follow up, which is uh, really nice. So, um, so at the moment, uh, it looks very good regarding this vessel, even if we stand it along sub into more. A, a segment. So calcified post cavity CTO lesions are probably the most challenging CTOs. sub intimal tracking is sometimes the only solution and there is probably a high incidence of post-interventional pseudoaneurysma. Long-term results of, of, of long sub intimal tracks are unclear at the moment and should be avoided if possible. And long sub intimal tracks in the proximal mid LED is a relative, in relative contraindication for subsequently standing from my personal uh, point of view. Yeah. Well, I must say, these are very impressive case, and the calcium is indeed one of the hardest uh, lesions to penetrate. It's very impressive that you were able to get them done and get a nice result. The one thing I want to ask you is, uh, I've had cases like this where I go aggressive post dilation, go high pressures, big balloons, and I perf. So I've had a similar case, very calcified, got some sexual re-entry, re entered and then during the post deal, the patient perf. So are you a little more, maybe it's an end of one, so I might be personally biased, but are you a little more conservative in terms of stent sizing and being high pressure inflation on these very calcified vessels? At this moment, it was, I think, 2014, I was uh, locked in sub intimal space. I didn't have a perf, but uh, last year it occurred to me. Uh, really, it was one of the first uh, uh, cases I made in new center. <laughs> it was a very, very calcified case. And uh, uh, finally, everything went good, but I had a perfect sub space. And it was interesting because I, I had to, to uh, uh, put a, for sure a cover stand to yeah, percut, synthesis, everything. And uh, there was still, um, after I stopped, there was still a, a aneurysma, like a, a, a pseudo aneurysma. Yeah. And we did CT scan and we could see a three to five centimeter pseudoaneurysmatic formation. 
So one week later, uh, we, 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 we still uh, we, we, we did a re-CT and it was still there. So we decided to bring the patient back again on the table, did IVIS, and then I, and uh, the, the interesting thing was that the entry was much more proximal than I thought. So I put in the third cover stand there and it was, it was okay. So this false aneurysm was not, uh, there was no perfusion anymore in that false aneurysm. So I think we have to be a little bit, we have to be a little bit uh, uh, careful uh, with accuracy post uh, dilatation in subintimal space. And uh, uh, I, I was previously always the fan to have a excellent expectation, but um, mace rate in patients with, uh, with perforation is high and a long time follow up and is also uh, not good. So probably it's sometimes safer to accept the patient will come with an instant stenosis which I can treat with a simple drug gluten balloon angioplasty. So we have to be careful, I think, in this kind of cases in subintimal spaces. So. Absolutely. So word of, a word of caution, but again, phenomenal cases. This is a very good result for the patient, and I'm sure quality of life and VT. His VT, the first patient's VT uh, went away afterwards. Yes. Uh, so we are two years now, and he is free because he has his IC, uh, ICD control all the time. Sure. There's no issues in, at the moment. This is also a very controversial discussion with the electrophysiologists, yeah, because they say that uh, uh, ischemic uh, events are making. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, not VTs, they are making uh, 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 fine ventricular fibrillation, but sure. uh, so, but but we can see this also that it triggers sure. the border, the borderline triggers uh, also uh, VTs. Yeah. Well, I think it's a phenomenal case. Thank you very much, Cambis. That's a phenomenal case.